If you have a Bible, I'd like for you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2 today. Ephesians chapter 2, and the reason I'm turning there today is because it goes right along with our Bible school this past week. We're going to be looking at verses 8, 9, and 10 of Ephesians chapter 2. You know, we're going to stay in the series perspectives, and God kind of gave me this uh, word here uh, several months ago, several weeks ago, and it was uh, tied to the thought process of perspectives and how our perspectives on how we look at things in our life really make a huge difference on on the way we live our life and the things that we do in our life. And so what I wanted to talk to you about today was a perspective that I think that goes right along, as I said, with our BBS. In fact, it's part of our theme, Scripture Verse, and, and we're going to continue with that. And there's a, there's a word tied in there that I really wanted to focus on today, and that word is work. Work. Now, when we think about the word work, there's many people who have a different perspective on the word work, on work itself. And as we think about the word work, to some people it would be a foreign concept, right? In America, there's a lot of people who just don't believe in work, right? They, they want everything handed to them. And, and then that's why a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of people in this country are in trouble. To some people, they're workaholics. Does anybody know a workaholic? You know workaholics, right? Maybe you're one of them. Uh, maybe you have a problem with that. You're a workaholic. And, and then others... You know, it, it, it's going to work is like drudgery. Anybody, like, anybody have a hard time going to work? Nobody? Wow, everybody loves to go to work? Gary, okay. He's, he's the boss of his own company, and he hates going to work. That's, that's saying something right there. So it, it, it's, work can be drudgery. Work can be a grind, it, no enjoyment, a necessary evil. In fact, some people, as they go to work, they sing, I owe, I owe, so off to work I go, right? It's part of work. But then some people, when they think of work, they think about how, how awesome it is. How many of you think your job and your work is awesome? Anybody? Man, I tell you what, that, that's great. This side of the crowd, raise your hand. This side of the crowd, they just sit there with their arms crossed. So we, I think we've kind of segregated today. Now, some of you say, you know what, I've been retired for a long time, so I don't, I don't go along with that theme about work. You worked your time, and, and now that time is over. That's another philosophy perspective of work. So... Whenever we talk about word, the word work, there's many things that come to our mind. In fact, when the word work was mentioned uh, to one fellow, he said, you know what? He said, I just love work. He said, I could sit there and watch it all day. And then there was another guy that said, you know what? I, I'm a go-getter. He said, my wife, I get her up early in the morning and take her to work, and when she gets off at 4 o'clock, I go get her. See, you guys can lighten up a little bit. Okay? We can have some fun here today. You guys are like real tight and tense, you know. I don't know what's going on, but, but we, we like to be light and loose around here. We like to have fun whenever we talk about things. And we're talking about work. But what I want to talk to you today about is something that's not just the general word work, but it's something even more specific and very important that each of us understands and have the right perspective on, and that is spiritual work. The spiritual work that we see in the Bible the spiritual work that many people are confused about. It's a specific type of work. There's a lot of confusion, misunderstanding. They have the wrong perspective about spiritual work. So today, that's what I want to talk about because that word work we see in our text today, and it was part of our verses for this week, and, and Ephesians 2.10, talking about work. And so I want you to understand, when we talk about work, I want you to understand, there is some spiritual work that is created and designed for us to do. There is other spiritual work, what only God can do. And that's what I want us to understand today. There's some work that, only, that we can do, and there's other work that only God can do. And what I see in society today, what I see in our culture today, is those two things get mingled together, and it makes a mess of it. When you put those two together, all of a sudden, you have all these different philosophies about God, and, and just as the skit we talked about, you know, God chiseling away at our life, all these different things. But when it comes down to it, the spiritual work, really, that we need to understand is, is written out in the Bible. It's very clear. There's some things that God has for us to do, and there's other things that only God can do. And, and when we try to stand in the place of God, we get things out of context. When we try to do the work that only God can do, then we can make a mess of our lives. We get it all mixed together. The Bible gives us a clear understanding about work and what God can do. 
So what I want to do today, and I'm trying to kind of go through this quickly to get to my points because it's very important points I want to share with you today, is this, that spiritual work is a work of God. Now, we're going to talk about this from Ephesians chapter 2 today, and as I said, verse 10 was our passage that we memorized. We're his workmanship. So I, I want to all stand together as I read this passage to you here. It's a lot broader passage than I can preach on today. I could preach a whole series on Ephesians chapter 2. But I want to take this little nugget out of the middle of Ephesians chapter 2, and, and I want you to re hear what Paul's saying about work. He says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let's pray. Fathers, we come to you this morning. I thank you, God, for the, for the word that you've given me for today. And I just pray, God, that I would be a pure vessel that could speak your word, God, with clarity and truth and with the spiritual power, Lord, that only you can give. I pray that hearts would be ready to receive a word today. Father, that it would go into our minds and into our hearts and settle in and do the work that you have planned for each and every one of us today in our hearts. Father, we just thank you for Jesus, the, the work that he did, and what we're going to look at here today, and the work that only you can do, God. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. So this morning, what I want to give to you briefly is this. Three things we must all understand about spiritual work. That's what I'm going to be talking about today. Three things we must all understand about spiritual work. And the first one's this. God has done a great work for us. God has done a great work for us. Now, we talk about creation, and we talked about creation this week, and we talked about how God created all things. How many of you believe that God created all things? Amen. That's a work that only God could do, right? Creation. And, and we take things and we make things, and, and what we talked about this week, all the things that God gives us that we can make and do, and Professor Spark and all the experiments that he did, but all of it came from God that God created initially, and we work with that. We talk about creation. We look around and we see God and all of everything. We look out into the stars and look at all the creation out in the universe. We look at the minute things, you know, just like with a microscope, and we see all the intricate details of everything God's created. And I talked about the sands of the seashore, you know, how God created every grain of sand on the seashore. That's the magnificent God of creation, the work of God that he has. But today, from this passage, I don't want to talk about creation. I'm going to talk about salvation. God has done a great work for us. It is a... Now listen to me, guys. The work of salvation. This is where people get confused. This is where we lose people. This is where people think, think, try to take things under their own control. The work of salvation is a finished work. Did you hear me? I didn't hear any amens on that. The work of God is a finished work. Amen? And as we see that, we understand a finished work. Now, let me ask you this, just so you can get the context of a finished work. You, you know, have you ever seen someone, now listen to me guys, listen to what I'm saying. Have you ever seen someone that when you do something, accomplish something, finish something, they always have to add something to it? Do you know people like that? That they can never be satisfied, it's always like they have to add their two cents in, they think that they can do it better. They have to mess with it. And you're like, don't mess with perfection. You know, one of those things is my yard. Everybody knows that I love to groom my yard. And, and the neighbors all know that. And it's a kind of a competition between, between me and your brother across the road on who can keep their yards groomed the nicest. And, and so everybody knows don't mess with Don's yard. In fact, my grandkids know we can't have a slip and slide in Papa's yard because it would mess the grass up. We, we can't do this because it would mess the grass up. My neighbors say, do I need to take my shoes off before I walk across your grass? That's the kind of jokes that they make. But it's because I take great pride and joy in my yard and the way I groom it and the way I take care of it. I don't want anybody messing with what I feel like I've perfected. How many of you remember or still experience your mama's cooking? You remember the mama's cooking, you know, that I mean, just the finger licking, you know, I'm talking, uh, where's Tim at? Tim, you know, the, the, the chicken and noodle type cooking type stuff. And, and how many of you can imagine walking into your mama's kitchen and saying, you know what, mama, I think you could add this or take this out and make it better. 
I, I think that, you know, that's like my mom is cooking. I don't tell her anything because I, I am not educated when it comes to that, and she's much greater than I am at, ever will be at a cook. Now, it would be very a, a disadvantage to me to go into my mama's kitchen and say, you know what, I think you could make that a little bit better. I, I think you could make it a little different. In fact, it would be very harmful to my health because I would probably lose weight because she'd break my plate. So you don't mess with certain things. And, and, and we, we, it's an act of perfection on our part. In other words, how many of you like this? You ever had somebody who, when you're in a conversation with them or an argument or a discussion with them, they always have to get the last word in? Do you know anybody like that? I saw some nudging going on. Always have to get the last word in. Every time you have a conversation, you cannot end the last phrase. And I'd say, that's all we need to say about it. And they'd have to say, okay. Or I'd say, well, this is enough. Your kids, how do you like it when your kids do that? Your kids can never let you into conversation without adding something to it. It's, it's annoying. It's awesome. It's awful. You see, there are things in this world that God has created, and there are things in this world that God has done that we need to quit messing with. Did you know that? When we look at creation, we say, why, why do I need to add anything to God's creation? It's already perfect. When we talk about God's salvation, how many of us think that we can add to God's salvation? Well, if you do, then you're taken away from what God's done. You see, we get this blend of an idea that we can do something in and of ourselves to add to God's salvation. How do we do that? Well, when I talk to people about receiving God's grace, they, they talk about what they've done to receive that. When I talk about the mercy that God's shown us, it's as if they earned what they've received. And so somehow, mixed in between it, we feel like as we work, we earn what God has given to us. Let me tell you straight off, you cannot earn anything from God. It is all by God's grace. So when we look at this scripture passage in verse 8, where it says, For by grace you have been saved. Look at verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. In other words, the grace of God, you don't need to add to the grace of God. There is enough grace to go around. You don't have to add to or take away from it. There is more than enough grace. For by grace, it is a finished work of God through faith. It is not of yourself. And some people take that passage. Now listen to me. They take the grace of God for by grace through faith, and somehow they think the faith that they have in God is what saves them. The faith of God that you have in Jesus is not what saves you. Jesus saves you. The faith that you have is just receiving what has already been offered to you. In other words, it's like this. I have an illustration here, and somebody's going to love this today. I need somebody to come up here. I have a Dairy Ripple coupon. I need somebody up here come up here and receive this Dairy Ripple coupon. The first person to come up is going to get it. Are you kidding me? I should have known Mike was going to come up and get it. That's a $10 gift certificate right there, brother. Now stand right here for a minute. What, what did Mike do to earn that? I stepped out and I walked forward. Did that really earn that? No. How did he purchase that? He didn't purchase that. It was given to him as a gift. You know what Mike did to receive that? He said, give me, right? Give me. And because of that, Mike is going to receive, it actually is a $10 gift certificate. So it was probably greater. He thought it was for free ice cream cone. It's like 10 bucks. You can get a turtle sundae and take Sandy with you too. Maybe if you want to. Or you could take, you could take your favorite preacher too. Okay. So, okay, you can go sit down. You, 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 you have received the grace of God. No, you get it. No, you nothing. You can't, no, you can't earn it. Don't try to pay me back for something I gave to you. And that's what we do with God. Very good. Right? But we take that, and, and when we walk down an aisle and we say, God, I need to be forgiven, I want to be saved, somehow in our minds, we think that we have to add to what God's done. Well, maybe I need to pay God back, or maybe I need to do this, or it's, there's got to be a catch to it. it. It can't be free. Well, it wasn't free. God paid the price. That gift certificate was not given to me by the Dairy Ripple. It was purchased. Now, 
Within that, there was a price that was paid, but it didn't cost Mike anything for that. He didn't need to add to that or take away. He just needed to reach out his hand, for by grace you are saved through faith, reaching out to receive what God has already paid for. It is the gift of God, just like a gift certificate, but oh, what a gift certificate God has. It is the gift of God, not of works. I don't know how many people are on the highway to hell thinking they're going to work their way to heaven. They think somehow they're going to earn the favor of God, and when we get there, here's your gift certificate to get into heaven. You earned to get into heaven. That is not going to happen. You see, when we think about God's grace, we forget that God's grace is free. We can't add to it. We can't take away from it. We just receive it by faith, and God even gives us the faith to receive it. Did you know that? The faith alone that we have, guess what? You could not even have faith if God didn't give you breath in your lungs and a, a mind in your head and, and, and legs to walk on and all that. You receive it because God gave it to you to begin with. And so somehow we forget that God has done a great work for us, not of works. Why? Because somebody could boast. You see, we never boast about what we've done for God as if it's going to get us to heaven. I boast about my God who has already given me heaven. I work for God not because I want to receive his grace. I work for God because I've already received it through the salvation of Jesus Christ. It is a finished work. When Jesus died on the cross, Jesus died on the cross, and what were the last words he said? It is finished. A finished work of grace. So don't try to take away from the grace of God. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, lest you should boast. Next thing. God has not only done a great work for us, God can do a great work within us. You see, when I receive salvation... God has opened up the opportunity for me to serve him like never before. When God gives you the Holy Spirit, you have a power that you've never had before. When God gives you the talents and abilities, you are to use them for his glory like never before. You see, God can do a great work within us. You know, the initial work of salvation is what we just talked about. But I also want you to know there is a continual work, continuation of what God wants to do. You see... Somehow, just in case you're thinking, you know what, preacher, though, I just believe that, you know, if I'm a good enough person and I work hard enough and I give enough and I do enough good things, I'm going to get to heaven. Well, let me read verse 1 for you. We're going to back up here and look at verse 1. In verse 1, here's how Paul starts out this chapter. He says, and you he made alive who were dead in your trespasses and sin. Everybody say dead. dead. That's what you were. You were alive because of Jesus, but you were once dead. How many of you ever seen a dead person do any work? How many of you ever seen a dead person receive anything? A dead person can't do anything. They're dead, right? You were dead. We're talking about spiritual work, so we're talking about a spiritual death. Until you receive Jesus, you are spiritually dead. Not just sleeping, not just uh, not cognitive of what's going on. You're dead. That's what the Bible says. You he made alive by grace through faith who were dead in your trespass and sin. And look at verse 2, in, in, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. In other words, here's what Paul says. He says, you used to be dead like the rest of the world, but now you're alive in Jesus Christ, spiritually. When you look out there and you see people who don't know Jesus, you know, it should be just like, you remember that movie, The Sixth Sense? Where the, where the little boy says, I see dead people. That's what Christians should be looking at. We don't look at people just who need Jesus. We don't need, look at people who are bad people. We look at people who are, need Jesus. Because whether they're good or bad or whatever they are, if they don't have Jesus, they're dead. So, so when I see somebody who doesn't know Christ, I have compassion for them because I know without Jesus, they're dead. And, and as Christians, now let me, let me preach to the choir here a minute. As Christians, why do we expect dead people to act like they're alive in Christ? Why do we expect them to act like they know God when they don't know God? Why do they not, we not expect them to act worldly when they're of the world? You see, a lot of times why, why, why lost people, dead people, don't recognize Christianity is because they don't really see Christ. 
Because before you received Christ, you were dead in your transgressions and sin. And guess what? You may have been church your whole life. You may have been good, doing good deeds. You, as a kid, you know, you may have been uh, just all that, you know, for the Lord. But I can tell you, until you received Christ, you were dead. Somehow we get the idea that because, you know, I was a good person and, and my works were of this and that, I was okay and then I received Christ. The Bible says you were dead and you received the grace of God. You see, God can do a great work within us. What does God do? He gives us life. The life that you have spiritually is a work of God. It's nothing you've done. It's nothing you've earned. It's a work of God, a work of grace within your life. And so when God begins to work within our lives, then the passage in 2 Corinthians 5, chapter 8 become, comes to life. Now, now in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, starting in verse 28, that's, that's a very cool verse, but I like verse 29 too. Gary, I like 29 just as much. In verse 28, he says, and we know that all things work together, work there, see that where all things work together for those who love God. How many of you love God? Say amen. amen. For all of you, even no matter what circumstance you're going through in your life, as hard as it may be, as difficult as it may be, all things in the big picture, by God's grace, I know is working for good. Not all things are good, but all things are working for good in my life. I don't understand that. It's above my pay grade even, but i got to trust God by faith that everything goes according to what he wants to happen. So we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. He's talking about the believers, those who have accepted Christ by faith through grace that are now alive. But look, listen to verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Do you see that word conformed? That word conform means to make into. It's like a metamorphosis happens, transformation. And, and so once God has done a great work for us and he begins to do a great work in us, he wants to continue to that to transform us, to conform us into the image of Christ. Now just as Evie stood up here and, and God was chiseling away on her, that's what God wants to do in our life. And, and I don't know about you, but if you saw that big shiny chisel, how, how, how comfortable would that feel if somebody really was chiseling on your back? Sometimes when God works on us, it's painful, isn't it? Sometimes when God works on it, it's areas that we want to leave alone. God, I want this part. You, you go work over here. That's control, just like we talked about. Do you want God in control or you in control of your life? Because if you're holding on and not letting him make you what he wants you to be, then you're taking control of your life. God continues to work in our life to conform us to what? Into the image of Jesus. How many of you think you look like Jesus whenever you walk down the road? How many of you remember what you did last week and what you said last week and the way you acted last week and what you watched last week and the places you went last week and you could say, you know what, I was the image of Jesus last week. Now I know that we're all trying to become more like Christ. I know that we're all trying to be conformed and that's hard to do. Sometimes those words slip out. Sometimes we see something we shouldn't. Sometimes we hear things we shouldn't, think things we shouldn't. Sometimes we do things we shouldn't. Sometimes we don't do what we should do. But I always feel like I'm in good company because Paul said this in Corinthians. He said, what I want to do, I do not do. And what I don't want to do, I end up doing. How many of you can relate to that? I can too. But I know this at the end of the day. If I'm in God's hands and I'm letting him grow me, I'm being conformed into the image of Christ. So God can do, not only he has done a great work for us. And not only can he do a great work within us, but he also wants to do a great work, work through us. So first of all, God did work for us, and then he does it in us, and now he's going to do it through us. Now, the reason maybe that God isn't working through you right now is because you're not where God wants you to be. And, and, and maybe it's the thing that God wants to do great work, but we're not working with God. Look at verse 10, and that's where it comes in, and, and this is where it lands today. If you belong to Jesus, you're God's workmanship. You're created in Christ Jesus for good works. All the work that you do, that work is done because you are belong to Christ. You belong to Jesus, which God prepare hand, beforehand that we should walk in them. You know what? We're God's workmanship. You know what that word workmanship, uh, the Greek words is, um, let, me, let me get it right here. I got it written down so I didn't get it right. Poema. Poema. That's where we get our English word poem. 
So in other words, when I think about that, and I think about we are God's workmanship, and God is doing, he's done a great work for us, and he wants to do, and he's doing a great work in us, and he wants to do a great work through us, it's like a poem being written. It's like God has your life right now, and if you belong to Jesus, and you're trying to live for Jesus, he's trying to write the script out, and it's already there, God just needs to play it out in your life. It's like the, the script that, that Evie and, and, and JT went through a minute ago. The script was already there. They just had to play it out, work it out, because it was already there. So in your life, your, your plan, God's plan for you is already there. You just have to walk in that. God's plan is there, and his way is there. You just have to step into that. And the way you do that is say, you know what, God? I am here by your grace. I step into it through faith, and I will do whatever you want me to do. You know, one of Jeff's favorite phrases, he says, I'm just a work in progress, right? You know what? We're all a work in progress. How many of you messed up today already? Oh, come on now. Let's be, I want you down here to the altar if you didn't raise your hand. <laughs> we all mess up every day. There's things we do that we shouldn't and don't do that we should and everything in between. I can tell you what, I mess up every day. You mess up every day. There's things that we do that we shouldn't do, that we don't do that we should. We always are a work in progress. And not, until you get to be 100 years old, and then you're still a work in progress. You know, Mildred White had her 100th birthday last, last week. We celebrated on Sunday. And she's 100 years old. Isn't that cool? But God's still working in her. She, she's still a work in progress until God calls her home. So, so God wants to do a great work through us. You see, we're created and designed and empowered, just like we learned in Christ Jesus, to walk in them. So, Diane, was you going to play today? Would you come up, please? I just want to throw a few things out there for you to think about here for a minute. You know, like I said, God has done a great work for us. I hope that you can agree with that. God can do a great work within us. But God also wants to do a great work through you. So the question I'd have for you today is this. Are you walking within the works of God? I, I want you to ask your question. Let God ask you this question today. If God would say, are you walking in the works of God? Are you, are you, are you, are you, are you walking in the works of God? Because if not, I can tell you right now, things won't go the way God planned. If not, we're not where God wants us to be. If you're not walking within the works of God, it may be why you're struggling right now. Somebody here today is struggling. I know you are. There's probably a lot of you out here, and it may just be because you're not walking in the, in the steps of God. Maybe today you're failing. There's something you're failing at, and, and, and maybe it could be because you're not walking in the works of God. Maybe somebody here today feels a little empty and, and, and like life, what, what's the purpose of life? Everybody goes through that. Why, why am I here? And, and the older we get, we wonder, what, what is our purpose in life? And, and sometimes we feel defeated and we feel alone. And, and some of you are feeling that today. Walking in here today, you put on your Sunday best and walked in, but there's still all these things going on in your life and in your heart. And you know what God would say to you today? Just work with me, please. I know the future. I know what's ahead. I know you're struggling. I know there's hard things in your life. I know there's difficulties. I know that you may feel like you're failing. I know that, that there may be problems within your, your family and, and at your work or whatever it may be. But God says, you know what? You're still my child. And, and, and the question I would say to that would be, do you really belong to Jesus? You know, that salvation, maybe you've based your salvation too much on what you've done and not what God's already done for you. Y you know, we can get caught up in the fact that, you know what, I'm a pretty good person. And maybe you are a good person. I won't question that. But are you saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus? That's what the Bible says. Do you belong to Jesus? Not of works. Because you could boast about that, that I saved myself. Nobody saves themselves. That spiritual work belongs to God. You know, one of the greatest things about God's grace is this. Just like Mike came up and received that coupon a minute ago, there's always more God's grace. And you would think after Mike walked up here and received that, it'd be awful easy for somebody else to come up and get this one because you already know what it is. 
And you know what's in store for you. All you have to do is receive it. You have to step out and receive it. Not, not that you work for it, not that you've earned it. Just to step up and say, I'll take it. And that's what salvation is. Is there somebody here today, and I think I have somebody coming right now, that didn't wait. Uh-oh, I got, uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. Okay, here's what we're going to do. You're going to show these kids grace, aren't you? Now, there's enough here for both of you. Did you know that? And probably your friend, your, your brother, your sisters. So I want you to take this, and I want you to do what God would want you to do. I want you guys to take that, and I want you guys to share that with all, all your friends, okay? The ones that are sitting back there with, would you do that? Okay. You see, that's how God's grace works. How stingy of it would be for us to take that and say, you know what, I'm going to spend all this. This is all mine. No, it wasn't. God gave it to you, right? For by grace you have been saved through faith. You know what, Elaine, I've got another one in my office. I'll give you one after. Nope, I've got another one. You were brave enough to walk up here. But when it comes, now I'm talking about a $10 gift certificate from Dairy Queen, or uh, Dairy Ripple. But at this altar today, and, and, and not just because it's at this altar, but at this moment, there's enough of God's grace for you too. And that's already been bought by Jesus. He shed his blood for you. And if you're lost today, I would love for you to come and say, I, I don't want to tend to our gifts today, but I want to be forgiven of my sins and receive Christ and become all that God wants me to be. And guess what? It's not of works. It's because of God's grace in Jesus. And some of you Christians here today, you're saying, you know what? I know that, but I ain't living it. I'm not walking in the grace of God because I've gotten so far away from it that, you know what? I've got the gift certificate. I'm just not using it. It doesn't do any good if you keep it in your pocket. You got to go use it. You got to share it. Some of you haven't shared the grace of God with anybody for a long time, if ever. And it's the greatest thing in the world. And it's free because Jesus bought it for us paid the price that's what we shared with your kids this week that's what we want to share with you today Father God we thank you Lord for your grace and your mercy and your love and I thank you God that I was once dead spiritually and I couldn't work myself back to life you met me and you gave me the greatest gift of all Jesus Christ Jesus I thank you that you bought that certificate of death that I had, you paid the price. And you gave me life and freedom, joy, peace, strength. Even when times were rough, Jesus, you're there. That we would walk in them, that I would walk in your ways. That we would walk in your ways, Jesus. You've already planned it before us. We just have to step into it, Jesus. I pray for you to move today, God. I pray for this time that it sunk into our hearts and our minds. For by grace we have been saved through faith, that not of ourself, not of works, lest I, we could boast. Thank you, Jesus, for that gift. It's in your name we pray.